I'm reminded of a, a story that I know of that I think really tells us who and what we really are. You know, this is a fascinating conference. It's probably one of the more interesting conferences around. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. But then I've been in your midst a lot the last several days, and you really are very interesting and more than a little curious. And you remind me of the story of Mrs. Rosenberg, who goes to her, her uh, tour uh, guide and says, listen, darling, this year I don't want to go to Israel. I don't want to go to the south of France. This year I want to go meet, be with the, the Swami of the year, Swami Ananda, Nanda, Nanda. He says, Mrs. Rosenberg, have you any idea what's involved? You have to take five planes, and then you have to take a broken down bus out of Kathmandu, and then you have to take a yak cart over the Himalayas, and then you have to walk for a month, and then you're online for two months, go to Israel. <laughs> she says, no, yeah, book me already. So she take, does the whole thing. She gets a run, run, Kathmandu, broken bus, <sighs> helps push the yak, you know, over the Himalayas, Finally, gets on a long line and walks for a long time. By the way, giving advice to everybody, whether they understand her or not the whole time. Some of you are represent recognizing your mother, perhaps. But finally, she gets up to the entrance of the great cave where the most holy, you know, Lama Ananda, Ananda, Ananda is. She goes in, and people are chanting on either side. Mm -hmm. And there he is, this beautiful man, his eyes rolled up in samadhi, you know, clearly in ecstasy. And she leans over and she says, Morris, come home. <laughs> I tell you that story because I've been seeing all these Morrises here, you know. <laughs> who have been rather different from what their parents expected, you know. <laughs> you know, we are very, very different, and we have to be different because we're living in the most interesting time in human history, yes? yes. I mean, other times in history thought they were it, they're wrong, this is it. <laughs> because what we do will make the difference as to whether we grow or die, evolve or perish, and a lot of you feel... How many of you really feel that? Oh my God, it's partly up to me. Why was I born here? Why now? How many of you feel that? Were you just raising your hand to go to the bathroom in the other realm when they gave out the assignments for here? All right, a couple of stories to tell you where I'm coming from. My father was a comedy writer. He wrote the Bob Hope show. He actually wrote the joke, um, Who's on First, among other things. Though so I think it was he and two Jewish guys because it's a Talmudic kind of joke. But he, uh, he was writing the uh, Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy show. You're all too young to remember. Edgar Bergen was a ventriloquist. Charlie was his little doll. And he said to me, hey, Jeannie Pot, do you want to go talk to Charlie? Because I used to love to do that. And he said, yeah. I said, okay, yeah, let's go. So we went in, and there was Bergen talking to Charlie, rehearsing, we thought. He wasn't rehearsing. He was asking his dummy ultimate questions. <laughs> Charlie, what does it mean to truly love? Charlie, where is the soul? Charlie, is the mind in nature or nature in the mind? I mean, great, great questions. In this little dummy, clacking jaw, said, well, bargain. And he would answer with these brilliantly crafted examples of the wisdom of millennia. And then he would get, Bergen would get more excited. Yes, 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 but <laughs> am I really here? <laughs> You know, you know, something we all ask from time to time. And, well, Bergen. Well, anyway, my father, who was an agnostic Baptist from Texas, couldn't stand it. And he coughed, and Bergen turned around and saw us. And he said, hi, Jack, hello, Jean. I say, you've caught me. Yeah, Bergen, what are you doing? Well, I'm talking to Charlie. He's the wisest person I know. And my father was not buying that at all. He said, Bergen, it's you. It's your voice. It's your mind coming out of that cockamamie dummy's mouth. And he said, well, I suppose ultimately it is. But you know, when he answers me, and it is so brilliant, it is so much more than I know. It is so much more than I know. That stuck to me. I mean, this, I could feel my future walk across me, you know. 
Two weeks later, I went to 20 schools before I was 12 because we were always on the road. I was at my favorite school, PS6 in Manhattan, where they took us to meet the great elders of the time, Einstein. Helen Keller. How many of you know who Helen Keller was? By the time she was nine months old, she was uh, deaf and uh, blind and many other things. Well, she came in and she spoke to our third, I guess it was the fourth grade class, in this luminous voice of someone who has never heard the speech. And she was so deep and loving and just a beautiful, beautiful soul that when they asked, does any child want to come up and talk to her? My hand shot up. I had no idea what I was going to say, but I knew I had to speak to her. So I went up and she placed her entire hand on my face. And with the center of her hand, she read my words. And with her fingers, she read my expression. And I just with a child's savage honesty, I asked, why are you so happy? And she laughed and laughed and laughed, and she said, and this is roughly what she sounded like, my child, it is because I live each day as if it were my last, and life in all its moments is so full of beauty. Was she damaged? People would say yes. Was she damaged? Not at all. She had rewoven the remaining filaments of her senses into a network, a web, in which she caught all of reality. And that gave her her incredible sympathy, empathy, willingness to work with disadvantaged people all over the world. Now that stayed with me powerfully. And then <laughs> other things happened. I got adopted by Margaret Mead. You know who she was, the great anthropologist. I mean, she had a wonderful daughter. I have a great mother, but that was our, and she, our uh, experience. And she was very much taken by these stories. And she said, Jane, <laughs> I want you to go out and harvest the human potential. And so she sent me to all these different cultures. And she said, find out why that tribe in, in, in uh, West Africa has no warfare and no neurosis, as far as we understand. So I went and I studied this tribe. I lived with them. And you know, they did not think the way we do. They were, for example, the one of the times I was there, they were trying to work on sanitation. Did they think it? Did they make A, B, C, D, E and, and uh, you know, the diagnostic thing? Not at all. No, they drummed it and they sang it. Here, I'll show you what they did. We'll do it. Stand up. <laughs> Think of some big problem you have. <laughs> and so they drop. You're going to help get me drop. And they sang. And what they sang, and they did the chicken dance. Like this. And they sang. Hey, yay, yay, yay. Hey, yay, yay, yay. Hey, yay, yay. Hey, yay, yay. Hey, yeah, 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 yeah. And they danced some more. And after a while, they had the solution. What were they doing? You can sit down if you want. <laughs> they were, what they were doing, my friends, is that they were doing whole system interaction from both the within and without with the big problem of their time. And then she sends me to Bali. Jane, <laughs> this is literally what she sounded like. Go and find out why all these people are artists. <laughs> So I did, and I, I actually took, I studied uh, carving actually there, and what they did is they didn't study from a perspective of let's do this, that one, two, yes, and we then follow that now, not at all. They had the music on the background, Balinese music, uh, uh, and at the same time, they are going into trance with the music, and then in the trance state, in the trance state, the master takes your hands and you begin to carve something that's in front of you. In my case, it was a mask of the Balinese Shiva. And the music is going on and you're in trance. And suddenly there is a kind of incredible osmosis between you and the master carver. And of course, all in a different state. You didn't have time to block because you were 
you were not an encapsulated bag of skin dragging around a dreary little ego. You were in a def def definite mind-body state all together, and that was part of it. She took me up, sent me up to study the Yupik Indians and why all of them were such incredible mechanics. Well, I found out they had to be because their inner vision was so intense and powerful because they had been trained for many, many years because the environment was floating away all the time. So they had to have this internal vision. So having studied, and I have worked in 109 countries since 1958, and I've studied many people, and I've tried to, under the auspices of the United Nations, I'm a senior consultant to the UN in human development and social change, studying different ways of activating the vast realm of human capacities and human potentials to apply different ways of thinking, seeing, knowing, creating to problem solving, both locally and now globally, you see. And what we find out is, <laughs> I believe that the nature and the complexity of our issues today, where we can literally grow or die within the next century or two, in fact, it's been suggested that we may even, by the end of the century, there may be only 150 million of us left. I mean, the earth may be fine, but we will not be. So how many of you feel, I mean, the French have the word for it, that frisson, that urgency, that sense of, uh-oh, <laughs> I have to get out of there. I better grow as quickly and as deeply as I can so I become an adequate steward for this, the most critical time in human history. How many of you have that? Look at that. Yeah, all these Morrises. <laughs> And what this also means, friends, is what is the variety of the human potential? Because this is what I try to do, activate different kinds of potential in people all over the world and then apply them to social problems, you see. How many of you think in images? How many of you think in words? How many of you think kinesthetically with your whole body? How many of you think intuitively? How many of you find that you yourself are so strange you use potentials nobody ever thought of before? <laughs> now, the fact is that as you begin to develop what are called interior proprioceptors, inner seeing, inner hearing, etc., in relationship to your outer knowings, you begin to be able to become, as many of my researchers who are archaeologists of your own mind, spelunkers in the caves of your own creativity. The creative process is going on, as with Edgar Bergen, is going on all the time beneath the surface crust of consciousness. Now, beneath the surface crust of consciousness, there's many other things happening. You are not, as I said, this encapsulated bag of skin with a dreary ego. You are myriad-minded, you have many, many other selves within you. And the emphasis on the West, on ego self, and remember, ego is but one image of the multiple images of the human psyche. But having so many different selves, I gave an example yesterday to the folks I was talking to that I hate to write. I am phobic. I cannot write. But there's well over 30 books there and 270,000 pages of unpublished material. I had to write a book every month at one time. And, um, but I happen to be a very great cook because my mother, Maria Nunziata Serafina Graziella Fierino Perpetuo de Daro, born in Syracuse, Sicily, married Jack Houston of Texas, and they hate each other's food. And so I had to become the world's first fusion cook, making chicken fried polenta, you know, to try to make them get along. <laughs> But, so, but as a cook, I am not blocked at all. I have no blocks at all, because I'm so used to being a decent cook. And so I literally have to enter in as I become the entire persona of a cook in order to write. I stir in the ideas, I add the spices of different associations, you get the idea. We all have many other persona as part of the sub-themes of our personality. As you activate these different persona, you will become able to quicken all manner of abilities that you didn't know you had before. I mean, that's just a, a simple example. We are all storied beings, high storied beings. Once in Australia, in the middle of Australia, I asked 
about an elder wise woman. How do you find food out here? And she said, don't you see, mate? Don't you see that, that, that nice grass there? Well, there's nothing here. No, go, go there. Mm, suck on it. Oh, water. Oh, look at that little, that little turn in the soil. It would be a nice tuber. And then she said, you are, how can you live being as stupid as you are? <laughs> and then I asked her, Maisie, I said, Maisie, how do we two-leggeds differ from the wallaby and the kangaroo and the koala? She said, my mate, we're the ones who can tell the stories about all the others, which may be the great, great distinction. We are storied beneath the surface crust of consciousness. You are filled, and I have found this true all over the world with the great, great stories of the world. You know, the, the search for the beloved, the longing for the primary thing that will open up reality. The, the great <laughs> violence between ourselves and others, the great transubstantiation, we are all filled with stories. Now, what this says to us is that we are also in the time of the emergence of a new story. I happen to believe that one of the major points of this emergence is that we are fundamentally consciousness, and the universe is consciousness. And the quantum <laughs> revelations, and by the way, I recommend a book by Paul Levy that I helped in its development, Quantum Revelation. The quantum revelation is that you do not just live in the universe, but the universe lives in you. Think of what kinds of capacities this opens in you. If you are that paradoxical being who is fully who you are in your space-time suit, or I should say biodegradable space-time suit, but you are also the universe in a microcosmic way. I've been doing many, 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 many experiments for many years now to really show you ways that you can tap into this vastly different point of view which the great religious geniuses of the past knew about. And by so tapping in, you have conduits to realms of ideas, theory, and they are so exciting that you also have a passion for the possible and the momentum that lets you get out there and do what you have to do. Now, I'm an old Plato scholar. Uh, any, any Greeks around here? The opening lines of the Odyssey. Andra moyene pe musa polytropus. Sing in me, man. Sing in me, muse, and through me tell the story of the man of many ways. I could change it around in ancient Greek. Thank you. And so it, but you are beings of many, many, many ways. Plato talks about the idos, the divine ideas the imaginal structures of, from which imagination is but a pale and paltry example. As you tap into the idos, the divine ideas, then you quicken, you become alive, you become a cosmic agent, if you will. So what I'd like to show you, <laughs> two minutes, is I'd like to show you one way to do this. Would you stand up, please? I want you to know that each one of you is a carrier of an optimal template. If you will, you are part of the divine idea. The quantum blueprint. Okay, you can stop. Put your hands up so. <laughs> and I want you to imagine, and for the next few moments, accept that it is real, and you can close your eyes if you wish or not, and receive that this quantum blueprint that has been yearning for you all these years is moving toward you. And as you begin to feel it, the quantum blueprint, you'd have to practice this, of course. You know yourself deeply loved, deeply seen, empowered, quickened, called forth. And it, it is within this quantum blueprint is the patterns of your speciation, that is, the unfolding of the human species in you. Patterns for love, relationship, patterns of being able to learn on many different ways, patterns of creativity, patterns which allow you to become a catalyst for change, an evocateur of potential for yourself and for the whole world. Receive, 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 and practice 
and know, my friends, that in truly, you are the one that we all have been waiting for. Practice this receptivity of your quantum mind, your quantum body, your incredible capacity to open the door to be the portal through which the human heart can go to the lengths of God. Dark and cold we may be, but this is no winter now. The frozen misery of centuries cracks, breaks, begins to move. The thunder is the thunder of the flood, the flow, the upstart spring. Thank God our time is now when wrong comes up to meet us everywhere, never to leave us till we take the longest stride of soul folk ever took. Affairs are now soul size. The enterprise is exploration into God. What are you making for? It takes so many thousand years to wake. But will you wake for pity's sake? Thank you.